it's all over me. I'm so glad he changed me. See, I'm now a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, there's new life. I live by faith, not by sight. There is a new thing written down in glory, and it's mine, yes, it's mine. I've been the author of my story, and he's mine, yes, he's mine. There is a new thing written down in glory, and he's mine, yes, he's mine. I've been the author of my story, and he's mine, yes, he's mine. Well, I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. I am who I am because the iron tells me who I am. There is a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. I've met the author of my story, and he's mine. Yes, he's mine. There is a new name written down in glory, and he's mine. Yes, he's mine. I've met the author of my story, and he's mine. Yes, he's mine. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. There is a new name written down in glory, and he's mine. Yes, he's mine. I met the author of my story, and he's mine. Yes, he's mine. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. Yes, praise the Lord. It's important for you to know today. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how you were raised. It doesn't matter if you have any money. It doesn't matter if you're the richest person in the world. If you don't know him, you have nothing. You listen as we sing. and saw his bones traveled on to see Mohammed still wrapped up in his grave clothes but then I journeyed Precious Lamb, God's own begotten. You know what? 
He was no longer in that grave. If you knew him, oh, what a difference it makes just to know him as your Lord and Savior. Listen, if you don't know him today, uh, I implore you, get to know him before today is over. We have no promise of tomorrow. And I want you to know there is nothing like knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there is nothing better than him. 
There is nothing more fulfilling than him. Uh, there is nothing more joyous than him. Uh, there, there is nothing that is more peaceful than he is. Uh, there is no one more comforting than he is. There is no security like the security in knowing that he is your Lord and Savior. No matter what happens in this world, knowing that you have him to rely on, knowing that he is there with you through it all. Listen, we face some crazy stuff. Uh, we live in a day and age where we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen next week. Every time you turn on the news, it's something else crazy that you thought you'd never see before. Uh, but knowing that he was the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he'll be the same tomorrow, there is nothing like that. If you don't know him, I, I, I implore you, come to know him today. And he is ready to know you. He, he is willing. He has a desire to be your savior if you will come to him. Uh, this morning we are in uh, Psalm number 57. Uh, Corey is uh, traveling today, and he, and he didn't let anybody know ahead of time. That way you all show up. So. <laughs> so, uh, except for Tina. Tina would have my back. So. <laughs> but it's a wonderful place to be here this morning. I, 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 for a long time, I, I, I sat down, and I, I studied, and I, I looked, and I wanted so badly to preach a Christmas message, because I don't remember the last time that I preached a Christmas message. But, uh, but uh, the more that I, that I thought about it, and and the more that I prayed, the more that I looked, I kept coming back to Psalm number 57. And it's, it's not a Christmas message, but it's a, it's a message I think that every one of us need, especially in this time. At least I needed it. I don't know if anybody else, is, uh, as I was studying, it just felt like it was hitting on every single thing uh, that, that I had been uh, thinking about here lately. And uh, it was a big help to me. In, in Psalm number 57, the, the scripture tells us that uh, David, he, he wrote this psalm. Uh, when he was in the wilderness of En Gedi. He had uh, hid himself in the very back of a cave uh, away from Saul. And, uh, you see, Saul had uh, gone, and, and David, when he had, after he had killed Goliath, David had before that been anointed king by Samuel. Uh, Samuel had been called by God to go and anoint David so that David would one day be king. And, and, and then David went after that, and he, and he slew Goliath. And, and after that, he chased down a bunch of Philistines. And so uh, the children of Israel began to, to realize, hey, there's a superstar in our midst. Here, here's David. And, and they were getting excited about David. And the, and, and the Jewish women would go down the streets, and they would sing. Uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And so Saul... And the Bible tells us that an evil spirit entered his heart. A hate entered Saul's heart. And as that hate began to seethe inside of him, uh, Saul began to grow more and more jealous of David. You see, Saul was king at that time. And here came someone looking uh, in Saul's mind to take his throne. Uh, Saul saw David as someone that was going to steal everything from him. Saul uh, thought in his mind that David was going to take the throne. He thought in his mind that uh, David was going to take his family. He thought in his mind that, that David was just his enemy number one and hate built up in Saul's heart. And he, so uh, with all that was within him, Saul chased David. Uh, Saul sought to, slew, to, to slay David. So David was sitting on his porch playing his harp. And, and David respected the king. David wasn't going to take something from the king. Uh, but, but Saul went and he, he threw a, a, a spear at David while he's just playing the harp on his porch. And, and Saul then chases David all to, uh, through, the, through the land. He chases him to the land of the Philistines where the enemy is. He chases David into the wilderness. And he, and he chases David further and further. He, he, makes it, he tries to do everything he can to make David public enemy number one. And he sends David out or pushes pushes David out into the wilderness, and, and David and his men are in the wilderness of En Gedi. It's a place where there's mountains, and there's hills, and, there's, and it's very, very rough terrain, and there's these uh, steep uh, cliffs, and underneath the cliffs, there's these deep caves. And so David and his men, they go and they crawl back inside of a deep cave, and, and they go way, way back in the back where it's really dark, and, and they hide themselves from Saul. And while they're back in the very back of that cave, along comes Saul and his men, and they camp in the front of the cave. And so here's David and his men in the back of the cave, and there, there's Saul and his men in the front of the cave, and they have no idea that David's there. And in that moment, David begins to, to write down this psalm. He says, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. For my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge, until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me, he shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Salah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even among the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. A sharp sword. Uh, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. 
my soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Salah. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to open your word, Lord, for this time that we have to, uh, to come together into your presence and to praise and worship your holy name. Lord, I thank you for uh, each and every one that has decided to come out here this morning, God. I, I, I thank you for their desire to seek you. And Lord, I pray this morning uh, that we would just set aside everything that's outside these doors, Lord, that we would set aside our, our plans for later. We would set aside our, our schedule for tomorrow, Lord, and we would focus on you right now, Lord, that we would allow your word to work in our hearts and in our minds, God, that we, we would be receptive to let it uh, mold us and to draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray that uh, every Christian here would be drawn closer to you today and, and would grow to be more like you today. And Lord, I pray that if there be one that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would come to know you before it is too late. And it's in Jesus' blessed name that I pray. Amen. Uh, so we find here that Saul, he's in the back of that cave. And as he's in the back of that cave, he's been run to the ends of the earth. Uh, I mean, Saul has just absolutely made his life miserable, uh, made David's life miserable for months and, and I don't know, maybe years. Uh, uh, continuously, uh, Saul has chased after David. Saul has uh, tried to kill David. Saul has uh, kept David from being away from his, uh, kept David away from being with his best friend, Jonathan, who was Saul's son. He has done everything that he could to just make David's life miserable. Uh, he has done everything that he could to harass David. He has tried to kill David. He has, he has tried to, to, to defame David. He has done everything he can against David and David has just about had it I mean David is worn out David is tired David is broken down he's beat up uh, he's, he's been run constantly he hasn't had a moment to sit down and to rest and he goes back into the back of this cave and he sits there and I don't know about you but at this time I probably would have just curled up in the corner of the cave and, and just been like I'm done like, I, I throw in the towel, I'm done. Like, just let it be over. I'm just going to stay uh, right here in my hidey hole until everything just passes on. Uh, like, get, get, me a, uh, get me a box of Little Debbie. I'm going to go Corey on you a little bit. <laughs> give me a box of Little Debbie. Uh, give me some ice cream. Give me some coffee. Give me, like, I just, I just want to hide away from everything and just wait until it's over. I mean, that's, uh, I, I would be feeling very much sorry for myself at that point. Like, it would be, oh, woe is me. Why, why am I facing this? I mean, he was anointed by God to be king. He followed the word of God when he went and he slayed Goliath. He trusted in God when a, when a lion tried to attack his sheep and he took it out. And a bear tried to attack his sheep and he took it out. He's trusted in God every step of the way. And at this point, I, I, I'll be honest with you, at this point I'd be saying, God, why? I, I, I've done what you wanted me to do. I, I've gone where you wanted me to go. I listened to you when you told me to, uh, to go out there and, and take on a Philistine who is, uh, I mean, three times taller than I am, three times broader than I am, has a sword the same size as me. Uh, like, uh, God, when you said go do that, I trusted in you and I went. That's what I would be saying right now. Uh, I'd be saying, God, I've done everything. Why am I still facing this sort of stuff? Why am I still facing this sort of pain? Why am I still facing this sort of discomfort? I think that's probably where a lot of us would be, wouldn't it? A lot of us would be just, I mean, having our, just, just complaining to God. We'd probably be on Facebook. Uh, an, an, another day in my life is still miserable. Someone, someone please read this and feel sorry for me. Uh, but, but we don't do that, right? Not around here. Uh, but, but not David. No, we find here the, the scripture says, David says, Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. And so first he, he asks God for mercy. And then he follows up and he says, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. He says, uh, God, be merciful unto me because I trust in you. And I'm not going to take my refuge in my, in my feelings. I'm not going to take my refuge in food. I'm not going to take my, my refuge from any man. But in you will I find my refuge. God, I'm going to rely on you until these calamities be overpassed. He says, God, uh, I cry unto you because you have performed all things for me. He says, everything that I faced up till now, you've taken care of. And God, I know you're going to take care of this. And he says, I, I have confidence, God, because of what you have done in the past, that you will continue to provide. He says, you, know, you shall sin from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. He says, I'm, I'm among lions and I, I'm among men who are set on fire. I'm among those who have their, their deepest heart's desire is just to destroy me. But I will still, he says in verse number five, praise your name. 
Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let thy glory be above all the earth. He continues to praise and to worship, and, and he doesn't uh, uh, run away from the, the problem in such a way that he wants to throw in the towel and quit, and he doesn't give up in, you know, on his trust in God, but instead he reaffirms his trust and his faith in God. He says, they've, uh, they've prepared a, a, a net for my steps. They've laid a trap in front of me, and they've fallen into that trap themselves. He says, but my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Now, the first time that I read verse number seven here, many, many years ago, uh, I think we were having a, a devotion at home, and we were reading it, and, and, and when my mom went on to probably talk about what it meant, I, I just got focused on the idea of fixed. I was thinking about repaired. I, I thought his heart was broken because of all the trouble he's faced, and, and God's put it back together. Like that, you know, you, you, you can take that and run with it. God's uh, taking that broken thing and putting it back together. But, but I realized later on as I began to study the scripture a little bit more and, and as I began to realize that, that you can take uh, uh, the, the words in the scripture and you can go back and you can take these uh, uh, things called inter interlinear, interlinears and you can take uh, concordances, you can take the Strong's uh, concordance, you can take old dictionaries and find what was the Hebrew word. And that sh shines a lot of light on what's really going on here. We find the Hebrew word in this case that was translated to the English word fixed is kun. A and kun means established. It means fastened. It, it means uh, firmly tied. Uh, you see, when he says, uh, 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 when he says the, the word kun, it often uh, has with it the connotation uh, of being determined and fastened and fixed into a certain position and then immovable. Right. You see, so when David says here that my heart is fixed, oh God, my heart is fixed, he doesn't mean my heart has been broken by the situation that I'm facing and my heart has been, been, been torn down by the problems and the experiences that I'm in. He's not saying I'm all beat up by everything that I'm experiencing, God. He's saying, God, despite everything that I'm yeah, facing, right. my heart is planted and fixed and established in the, where, in the place that you have put me, in the truth that you have shown to me, in my trust and my faith in you, and I'm not going to move. You see, here David is saying, uh, my heart is established, and no matter what happens, I will not change. You, you see, that's the sort of statement we make when life is perfect. And that's the sort of statement we make when everything is just, I mean, sunshine and roses and, and, and just perfect. That's the statement that we make, you know, when we get up in the morning, we have our cup of coffee and the bad stuff hasn't hit yet. You know that moment when you go to work and like you sit down at your desk and, and you've got your coffee and you take a sip and it's like five minutes before your first meeting or, you know, whatever you've got to go do. And you're like, life is perfect right now. And then you get a phone call, and everything's just downhill from there. Like that, that, That's the moment where my heart is fixed. When the problems come, <laughs> things start getting a little shaky. But, but David here, in this moment, and, 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 and when he's tired, when he's beat down, when he's broken, when he's been chased to the ends of the earth, when, when Saul has made his life absolutely miserable, uh, David doesn't say, I give up. David doesn't say, I run away. David doesn't say, I quit. David says, my heart is fixed. I am established in your truth, God, and no one will change my mind. You see, he echoes here the same thoughts uh, that he has in, in other psalms. In, in Psalm number 16, he says, uh, verse number 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. You see, he's saying that no matter what happens, I will not be moved. I will not be changed. I will not be pushed away. I will not, be, I, I, I will not have my, my foundation shaken. I am fixed to your truth, God. And no matter what happens, I will not go away from that truth. I am, I am fixed. I am established. You see, I believe in this day and age, more so than ever before, there's a need for Christians to be fixed, yes, sir. for Christians to be established, uh, for Christians uh, to take the truth and the word of God, to take what thus saith the Lord, uh, to take what they know in their heart to be true, uh, to take what the scripture says, uh, knowing that that is the truth from God, that it is uh, that the inerrant, inspired word of God, and that no matter what the world says, we fasten ourselves to that truth, and we fix ourselves to that truth, and when the world begins to beat on us, and when situations and circumstances begin to beat on us, and, and everything around us tells us uh, to change our minds, and to change our stance and to soften our position we say no I'm right here and my heart is fixed you see we need more so than ever before Christians and churches to fix themselves to the truth of God because I see it happening all around us 
people are moving. Churches are moving. Individuals, Christians are moving because th th there's pressure from society to move. Uh, there's pressure from the culture to move. Uh, th th there's, there's pressure from, uh, from, from all around us, from, uh, from, from the institutions around us, from the government. From, uh, there's, there's pressure from, uh, from the schools. There's pressure from everyone to change our stance because that stance is old-fashioned. Uh, because that stance is, is bigoted. Uh, because th that, that stance is, is hateful. Because that stance, it doesn't apply to this day and age. That's what people say. And, and the church begins to hear that and hear that and hear that. And, and instead of saying, this is what the Bible says and so I'll stick to it. They say, well, the Bible was written an awful long time ago. And things sure have changed. And we live in a different culture now than we used to. We live in a different climate now than we used to. And, and we see the church begins to soften their position on sin. And suddenly sin's not sin anymore. And suddenly wrong's not wrong anymore. And, and, and people begin to focus on what feels good. And, and what's comfortable. And, 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 what, and what seems uh, uh, pleasant and what seems desirable. And, and all these things that just, uh, that they just seem like uh, they're so much more easy. And we want to just go with the flow and, and follow along with those things uh, that, that are simple and easy. And we find the scripture tells us. In, uh, uh, over in uh, the, the book of Timothy, I, and I can't remember where it's at now, so I'm just going to try to quote it. But uh, the scripture tells us that in the end times, that men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Right. And that they'll have a form of godliness, yeah. but they'll deny the power thereof. You see, when you have a little bit of religion, and you come together in church, and, and you sing some songs, and you seem kind of spiritual... But you deny the truth. That's a form of godliness. But you've denied the power thereof. When you have a little bit of truth, but then a whole lot of, of compromise, you've denied the power thereof. And I'm afraid in this day and age, there are churches everywhere denying the power thereof. And you see, I've talked about it on Sunday night. The problem with that is then people come together in a church and they don't realize that sin's a problem. And if sin isn't a problem then I don't need a savior. Because what do I need saved from? If I'm pretty good, if I'm okay, if I'm not so broken, if my sin isn't such a big deal, if my sin is an affront to the righteous holiness of God, if I don't deserve death because the wages of sin is death, then that doesn't mean, that means I don't need a savior. That means I need a self-help program. That means I need a pat on the back. That means I need somebody to say like, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be all right, just keep doing you. See, but that's not the way that it is. Amen. You see, what we need is a Savior because we are sinners. Right. What we need is the truth because we've been fed lies for too long. Well, what we need is a steady foundation because this world is constantly changing. And Christians, in order to show this world that they need a Savior, in order to see people saved and see lives changed, Christians and churches need to look at the truth of God, fix themselves to that truth and say, no matter what I see, I shall not be moved. No matter what pressures come upon me, I shall not be moved. You see, because when your heart is fixed, there's something amazing that begins to happen. My, my son, Ben, he has a fascination with rushing water. He has had a fascination with rushing water since, gosh, I, I don't know, since he was uh, maybe two, maybe a little bit before two. Just he, he is absolutely, he loves rushing water. I said water and I got thirsty. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I remember when he was when he was about two years old, to, even when he was uh, three years old, even now, uh, whenever uh, the rain would begin to come down and, and would begin to go into the gutters, he wanted to go out and look at it. And I, when he was three years old, that whole summer, he wanted to go outside. And when the rain would fall, uh, all of our gutters are tied together, and they go down to the parking pad. And underneath the parking pad, there's like a I don't know, like a six or eight inch pipe that goes out, and it comes out on the other side, and it goes off into the horse field. And when all those, those gutters come together, when all the water comes down to the parking pad, it all rushes into that and goes into the black pipe first. And, and then it goes out and it goes into, uh, into the white pipe and then it shoots off into the horse field. And, and he likes to get underneath that white pipe and watch the rushing water. And, and he would get under there and, and, and he would play in it and he would get filthy and, and muddy and wet and, I mean, just disgusting. And a smile from ear to ear, just having the time of his life. And he realized one day that, that he could build these dams. And, well, actually, I, I did it first. I, I, was, I was the culprit. 
<laughs> but, uh, but, but I went, and I, and I, and I took, and, and, and I built a little dam out of mud, and, and, and kind of piled it up, and, and the water would fill up the dam, and then I would go, and I'd take my foot or my hand, and I'd uh, brush it all the way, and then the water would really rush. And it would just, I mean, take off and move on. And, and I was working on something in the, in, in the cabin. And, and he was over there playing in the mud. And, and I hear him start crying. And I, and I run out there. I'm like, what's wrong, Bubby? And, and he, he has these sticks that he's laid there in front of the rushing water. And he's trying so hard to build a dam. He says, I put them here, Daddy. And, and then they just get knocked down out of the way. So he said the water keeps hitting them, and he, and he got some toys. He had some little cars and, and, and different toys that he was piling up there trying to build a dam, and, and the water would hit those plastic cars, and they would just rush, and they would just get pushed on down into the horse field. And he, and, and he was trying to do a little bit of mud and stuff there, but, but, it, but it was also, he wasn't packing it down, and so it was just getting washed away too. And everything that he put into the rushing water, well, that water would hit it, and it would just wash it away, and off it would go. And so I say, hold on one second, watch this. And I go and I, I get a big old rock. I mean, like a big old rock because I, I want him to like, know how strong daddy is. And I, I, I mean, I come over there with this big old rock and I, I, I take it over and I, I drop it right into the middle of the rushing water, right in front of the pipe. And, and the pipe comes down and it hits in front of that rock. And it hits up against the side of that rock and it begins to fill up. And then all of a sudden water begins to, to go around the rock and it's going off in a stream this way and a stream this way. And he's like, oh my, and his mind is blown. He said, daddy, you made two streams. It, 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 there, there's two streams now and, and then I went and I put another rock in and it stopped one stream I put another rock in and he's like this is the biggest dam ever and, and it just kept getting bigger and, and bigger and bigger and all of a sudden everything where that water was rushing now it was stopped and where there had been two streams and it split and everything was changed the water couldn't affect those rocks because those rocks were fixed you, you see I, I was thinking about that uh, there yesterday, yesterday afternoon as I was studying and and you see, society and the culture and everything around us in the world is a lot like rushing water. And you see, as long as Christians aren't fixed, we get out there in it. We go to work, we go to school, and we go to our jobs, we go, uh, we go do our thing, because we've got to get in it at some point. We can't stay out of the water forever. At some point, you've got to get into the water. And when it hits you, well, all of a sudden, there's this pressure to compromise. There's this pressure to give in. There's this pressure to change your stance because, well, that stance isn't modern enough. And that stance isn't the way that people see things nowadays. And, and all of a sudden, this pressure comes down on you. And Christians whose hearts are not fixed, they go with the flow. And the water washes them on. And they're like those sticks and those plastic cars and, and all the other things that Ben was trying to build a, uh, build a dam out of. And they just get washed away. But when a Christian, when a church, uh, when, they, when they go and they're like a rock firmly established then all of a sudden that water that's coming against them it hits them and it doesn't move them and then and then something even more amazing happens the water moves and, and, and the the stream that was going this way well begins to go off and little uh, little eddy currents and little little streams and other things going this way and then all of a sudden the path of the water was changed because it hit something immovable you see when christians fix themselves to the truth of God's word. When Christians fix themselves to the truth of who Jesus Christ is as their Lord and Savior, when we fix ourselves to the promises of God and that no matter what this world comes after us with, we say, I'm fixed to this position and I will not change. The pressure will hit us and the world will hit us and they will push on us and push on us and push on us and all of a sudden when we cannot be changed, around us, things begin to change. Around us, the world begins to change. Around us, lives begin to change. All of a sudden, our co-workers who say, well, there's nothing to that church thing. Begin to realize, well, maybe there is something to it. Because no matter what happens to this person, they're faithful. No matter what happens to this person, they're steadfast. No matter what, 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 what pressure is on this person, they still stand on what they believe. Maybe there's something to that. You see, when Christians, when churches fix their hearts, people around them begin to change. Society around them begins to change. The culture around them begins to change because they realize they can't move you. And all of a sudden, we begin to see an effect all around us when we have our hearts fixed. You see, we find here in the scripture, I believe in, in Psalm number 57, several effects of a fixed heart. The, 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 these effects, these things that happen all around us, effects within us and without us that occur when we fix 
our hearts to the truth of God. It's because of this that the scripture tells us in the New Testament. Well, you'll, you'll find phrases like hold fast and, and stand firm and, and to, be, to be immovable and steadfast, always abounding in the faith, to, to, to stay where God has put you. That's why you find in Ephesians, the scripture tells us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And then on in the, uh, further on in Ephesians in that chapter, the scripture tells us having done all to stand. That means having exhausted every resource, continuing to stand. That, that is constantly pushed in the scripture. Why? Because if we don't stand fast, we will have no effect. Amen. We won't see changes around us. We won't, see, we won't have the impact that we should have on this world. We were saved. God saved us. When we are saved, we are intended to have an impact. Amen. If, if that were not the case, the moment that you're saved, God would just take you out. Come be in heaven with me, because there would be no reason for us to continue down here. But when you're saved, you're, you're sealed, and you're intended to hold fast and to change the world around you, because you have friends and family members that need to be saved. You have co-workers that need to be saved. And so we must be fixed. We find here in the scripture the first effect of a fixed heart. We find in, in David's life, we, we look at verse number one. He says, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. For my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until the calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Salah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. See right here, David, in the midst of all his trouble, and in the midst of all his suffering, in the midst of all his pain and all the pressure that's being put on him from every direction, he says, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. And then with confidence he proclaims, he shall send from heaven and shall save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. You see, he has confidence and trust. And he doesn't throw in the towel and give up, but he reaffirms his faith. You see, the first effect of a fixed heart is faith that cannot be swayed. You see, when your heart is firmly planted in the truth of who Jesus Christ is, who God is, and trusting in Him, fixed to that position, unchanged by your circumstances and everything around you, then we'll find that our faith isn't shook so easily. And what we'll find when, when things begin to beat down on us, we can have confidence knowing that God can take care of us, knowing that God can save us, knowing that He is able, uh, knowing that, that no matter what the problem is, no matter how big the problem is, that He will keep us fixed, that He will keep us established. You see, when David makes this statement, it's not because David is, is just an absolute champion of a person, is somehow just way above and beyond anything that we could possibly reach. You see, David makes this statement because David's not relying on David to stay secure and fixed and fastened. You see, he's trusting in something bigger than David. That's why he says in Psalm 16, verse number 8, uh, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, yes. I shall not be moved. Amen. See, he doesn't say, because I'm a, I'm a champion of the faith, <laughs> I shall not be moved. He doesn't say, be, uh, be, because I've, I've sat in the same pew for the last 20 years, I shall not be moved. Because I know all the hymns, I shall not be moved. And because I'm faithful Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I, I shall not be moved. He doesn't say, because my, my grandma, my papa, my papa's papa were all in the same church, I shall not be moved. He is firmly fastened because God is at his right hand, not for any other reason. You see, he is, he is where he is, and he will not be moved because of who is holding him in that position. When I was growing up, I loved, I loved the game Red Rover. I don't know why. I, I always got hurt, like literally every single time I got hurt. But, but I loved it. I always wanted to play Red Rover. And we would get together. We would go, I mean, at uh, family get-togethers, we would play Red Rover. And we, we'd go up to the, the Christian school, and, 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 uh, and we would hang out with them, and we would play Red Rover. And, and when we would play Red Rover, for whatever reason, I would always get asked to go on over. I don't know why. Like, I mean, out of everyone there, like, uh, I mean, the, they, would, they would survey the field. And you've got, you know, 10 or 15 uh, uh, kids over there. And, and they're looking along. And there's, you know, 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds. There's, there's some older kids. And, and then they look at, you know, 75-pound me. And they're like, 
that's the guy we want to come on over. And, and, so, and so it's Red River, Red River, send Daniel on over. And, and, I, and I would go with all of my might. I mean, with everything within me because I was convinced I was going to break that line. And I would charge full steam ahead. And, and I would smack into it like a bug on a windshield. And I'd just be like, Psh! and then I'd fall to the ground and it would be over. And, I, and so I'd join up with that line. And, and, and then I'd be on the, the opposing side. And, and I remember oftentimes when I'd play Red Rover, I would get put in the same position when we were forming our line. I would get put right beside my buddy Jonathan, who was like four years older than me and like 200 pounds at 16 years old and like six foot two. I mean, he was huge. And I would get put beside David Haney, who he was like a 17 year old or something like that at that time. And, and he was a stout guy. I mean, he was big. He was uh, he was tall. And, and and here I was. I mean, I wasn't the strapping, brawny, uh, physically, uh, you know, swole man <laughs> that I am today back then. I know it's, it's, that's hard to believe. Uh, I know it's, it's a stretch of the imagination, but I wasn't always the specimen. Uh, but I used to be scrawny. Um, but I can't say it with a straight face. Um, but, and so I'd be put between these two guys, and, and I'd reach over, and I'd take Jonathan's hand, and I'd take David hand, David's hand, and they'd be like, no, David and Jonathan, I just realized... Never <laughs> anyway, I'd get between David and Jonathan, and I'd take their hands, and they'd be like, no, 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 no. And Jonathan would grab my wrist, and David would grab my other wrist. They'd be like, you don't hold on to us. We, we got you. And then it'd be Red Rover, Red Rover, since so-and-so on over, uh, over, and the whole line's in front of them. Who do they pick? Yeah, we're going after Daniel. And so here they would come full speed ahead, and they would just smack right into me. And my feet would go up off the ground, and I'd be just be hanging there. I mean, like a clothesline. And I'd be flapping in the wind, and I'd just hang in there. This shoulder's coming out of socket. This shoulder's just barely hanging on. This one still comes out of socket every now and again. It's many games of Red Rover. And I, I'm there, and, and I, I mean, I, I can't do a thing about it. But I'm also not going anywhere. Not, not because the strapping young man that I was, 70 pounds, uh, with my heaviest clothes on, uh, soaking wet. <laughs> not because I was fixed. Not because I was strong. Not because I was able. Not because I was, I, I was so capable that I could keep myself in that position. Because someone so much bigger than me had a hold of me. You see, I stayed where I was. Fixed. Unbreakable. Unmovable. Because someone else had a hold of me. You see, David says, my heart is fixed. And God, you're the one who's fixed it here. You're the one who has established me to your truth. And God, I'm trusting in you because you're the one holding on to me. You're the one that has the situation. Why is it that he's able uh, to, to maintain his faith despite all the problems, despite all the, how, how terrible the circumstances are? Because God has a hold of him in the midst of that circumstance. Because God has fixed him. And to the position where he is. And because God has established his ways, he knows where he stands. You see, when we trust in the one who has a hold of us, when we are established in the one who has a hold of us, when we are fixed by him into the place where we should be, suddenly our faith isn't so shaken when the next problem comes. Suddenly our faith isn't so shaken when, when the next tragedy occurs, when the next issue comes up. Suddenly we don't find ourselves falling apart when the world continues to beat on us, when situations continue to beat on us, because our heart is fixed, and we know who has fixed it. We know who has established it. We know who has a hold of us. And because he is at our right hand, we shall not be moved. You see, when your heart is fixed, you have a faith that cannot be swayed. Not only that, when your heart is fixed, you have a focus in the midst of fear. We find in verse number, in verse number in verse number four, he, David says, My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. See, here he has painted a picture for how dire his situation is. He's saying, I, my soul is among lions. He says, I'm surrounded by those that just want to devour me and eat me up. He says, I, I, I lie even among them that are set on fire. He says, all around me is turmoil. All around me is brokenness. I, I, am, I am just faced on every side by, by these great challenges. He says, whose teeth are spears and arrows. He says, they're coming after me with things that will tear me apart. 
with things that will break me down. They're coming after me with things that are, that are just going to absolutely tear me to pieces. And he means this physically, for real, because Saul is coming after him with a sword and with many men also armed with swords. He says their tongue is a sharp sword. They're saying what they can to break me down and to tear me down. He's saying, I'm facing all this. And so in the next verse, of course, he's saying to say, woe is me, right? He says, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. See, despite everything that he's facing. See, I think he only painted that picture of how bad things were. So then he could show how important it was to continue to keep his focus on God. To continue to keep his eyes on God. Even in the midst of all that challenge, his eyes were on God. His focus was on God. His praise was towards God. You see, when I, when I start facing problems and challenges and, 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 and rough times, that, that, that's the Sunday morning when I get up and I'm like, man, I just don't feel like it today. When, when it's circumstances just beating on me, that's the, that's the Wednesday night where I get out of work and I'm like, man, I just want to go home today. You see, that so often it's, I, I want to go focus on my problems and continue to focus on, on the issue, and then the issue just seems like too much for me to handle. But when our focus is on Him, all of a sudden, despite the problems, we give Him praise. Despite the circumstances, we still serve him. Despite everything that's going on around us, our focus continues to be on him. You see, this is exactly like uh, the Apostle Paul says over in 2 Corinthians. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, we find that, uh, that Paul makes this statement right here down around uh, verse number 8. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. He says on down in verse number 14, he says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory or of God. Redound to the glory of God. He says, you see, he's saying here, we're troubled. We're facing problems. And Paul really was troubled. I mean, he was shipwrecked multiple times. He was imprisoned multiple times. He was beat multiple times. They attempted to stone him more than once. And he was constantly troubled. He constantly faced persecution. Uh, Paul was beat down and everywhere that he went. He, he was shipped from place to place to place, uh, being put on trial, uh, eventually until he faced trial in Rome. Uh, I mean, Paul was constantly under persecution. Yet he says, I was troubled, but I'm not distressed. He says... I am perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I am persecuted, but I know that I'm not forsaken. He said, I'm cast down, but I know that I will not be destroyed. Why? He said, because I always bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. He's saying, when I suffer, I know that makes me just a little bit more like him. When I suffer, I know that gives me a better opportunity to glorify him. And he says, and despite the fact that I'm being delivered to death, I know that I can focus on him. Why? Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also. And he says, knowing this, that it will rebound, that it will redound to the glory of God. He's saying, all that I do, all that I face, when I focus on the glory of God, it's not such a big problem anymore. When I focus on the suffering of Jesus Christ, suddenly my suffering isn't such a big deal anymore. He's saying, when I, when I keep my eyes on the prize, when I focus on Him, then all of these problems and these issues that I face begin to melt away. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once said, how much easier and brighter our storms would be if we would only focus on God instead of the waves. If we would only focus on Him instead of the problems around us. If we would only focus on him instead of our pain and, and, and our discomfort and our suffering, all of a sudden, things wouldn't be as bad as we think they are. All of a sudden, that problem would be more manageable. All of a sudden, we'd be able to praise God despite our circumstances. All of a sudden, we'd be able to rejoice in what God has given us when we look at all the things that have been taken away, knowing that it's all for his glory. 
knowing that when we stand, we stand for him. Amen. When we suffer, we suffer for him. When we rejoice, we rejoice for him. And when we glory, it's in him that we glory. Right. If only our focus could be on him. When our heart is fixed, that's where our focus is. Yes. When our heart is established, that's where our focus is. You see, uh, over in, uh, in the book of Daniel, when the three Hebrew children are thrown in, into the fiery furnace, at that point, they could have just huddled up into a, into a ball, got over in the corner, you know, tried to stay away from the coals, but they had confidence in their Savior. And so the scripture tells us when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire, and he saw three men, four men, excuse me, not, not, not four men huddled up in a corner, up and walking about. He was like, who's that fourth guy? Well, it looks like Jesus Christ, Son of Man. He says, I see three men up and walking about. Why? Because those men were focused not on the flames, but on their Savior. They were focused on their God. They were giving him glory. And at that moment, the enemy was looking on. At that moment, Nebuchadnezzar was looking on. Let me, know, uh, let me tell you something. When you face problems... And when the folks around you know that you're a Christian and they see you facing that stress and those problems, they're watching. They're waiting for you to crumble. They're waiting for you to throw in the towel. And when they see you in the middle of the flames, up and walking about, praising God, praising his holy name, and they see Jesus Christ right beside of you by your, uh, by, by, by your witness and your testimony, then all of a sudden they realize there really is something to this. Amen. See, at that moment, everything changed in Babylon. Because those men held fast, stood fast, were firm and were fixed despite everything around them and all the pressure to bow down to idols and to bow down to what society was telling them to bow down to. They were focused on God. You see, when our hearts are fixed, we have a focus in the midst of fear. And finally here, the, the third one, when we, our hearts are fixed, we have a firm stance in the face of temptation. Now this is one that hit me yesterday. Down here in verse number 6. Uh, David says, they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. When I, when I read this a, a long, long time ago, I, I, I saw this and I, and I thought, man, that, that just put me in the mind of, of, of Looney Tunes. Uh, of Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner. Like, that's exactly who I thought of right away. Because, I mean, he says it. He, he says, uh, my enemies have laid a net before me. They dug a big old hole and they covered it up. And then they, they put some, some leaves across it, made it look real nice, and then they fell into it. And so I just picture Wile E. Coyote uh, up there, I mean, just uh, stringing out this, this big cable and going through all these pulleys. And he has a, a piano up here. And he's like, all right, this is going to get Roadrunner. And he goes out there and that piano comes down. And, you know, uh, accordion, he's, he's bouncing away and he's smashed. Those shows were violent. Why did I watch those? <laughs> that was the good stuff. Um, but, uh, but, but, but here he is caught in his own trap. And I thought, man, that's pretty cool. I, I want to see that happen to Saul. I want to see him caught in his own trap. And, and so I, I, went, I went running through the scripture. And I, I looked back in 1 Samuel where this all happens. And I, and I looked in 1 Samuel uh, chapter number 18 and, and saw the beginning of the story. And, and, and I looked through uh, chapters uh, 19 and, and 20 where, where uh, Saul continued uh, to, to run after and to chase David. And I continued on through and, and saw where David fled into, uh, into the Philistines and saw where, where David and his mighty men tried to, to hide in the cave and saw where, where, where David had, had been there among the enemies. And I saw all these problems. And I saw when uh, Saul comes into the wilderness of En Gedi and he, and he chases David all the way back into a cave in 1 Samuel chapter number 24. And I'm looking everywhere for a trap that Saul falls into. And I never find it. And I just kept looking. And I never found it. I thought, well, Saul is David's enemy, right? Where did he put that trap at? Where's that hole that he dug? Where's that big pit? Where's that net that Saul then gets caught in himself? And then I realized something. Saul wasn't David's enemy. Saul was David's king. Saul was God's anointed. He had been anointed to be king. Later on, he went against the things of God, and so David was anointed. God was going to push Saul out of the way. But Saul was still God's anointed king of Israel. And David saw him as his king, not as his enemy. Despite all the persecution, despite all the, the beatings that he took at the hands of Saul. And, and so what was the trap that they fell into? That's when I realized Saul fell into the trap all the way back in, in uh, 1 Samuel, I think it's uh, uh, chapter number 17 or 18, when that evil spirit entered into Paul's heart. And hate 
filled up into Paul's heart. And the trap, or I mean Saul's heart, the trap that Saul fell into was a pit dug by Satan. A pit dug by his demons. It was a trap of hate. It was, it, it, it was a trap of anger. It was a trap of, uh, of taking those matters into his own hand. Of, uh, of destroying David who he was jealous of and who he was angry about. That was the trap that was before Saul. And so what was the trap that was before David? We find it here in, Saul, uh, uh, in Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. It says, Then Saul, verse number 2, took 3,000 chosen men out of Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into uh, I will deliver thine, uh, thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord." And so David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise up against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. You see, David, I picture him now, standing above Saul, looking down on Saul as Saul's just laying there fast asleep. I mean, Saul is out like a light. And he's, he's there and he's got, he's got his blanket over him and, and Saul's fast asleep and David has his sword in his hand. And David's buddies are saying, this is your chance. This man who has just absolutely made your life miserable. This is your chance for revenge. This is your chance to be done with it. This is your chance to take him out. This is your chance to get what's yours. Take care of him and you can go be king. You've already been anointed. They're saying that this is your opportunity to just be done with Saul for once, uh, once and for all. And I imagine that David began to think, yeah. This is my chance. This is my opportunity. I could just take care of him right now. I could get my revenge. This man who has done so many things to me. This man who has hurt me in so many ways. This man who has made my life miserable. I could just take him out right now. And then David suddenly realizes exactly what's in front of him. It's a trap that Satan has dug. It's a pit that the devils have put before him. And they've covered it up. And they've tried to make it look like something God gave him. Even his friends were, for, fell for that. They said that this was God's delivered you into his hands. But David realizes that that hate and that anger and that revenge, it's temptation. That it's the opportunity to take it into his own hands and do what he wants to do. Instead of focusing on the things of God. And at that moment, I believe it's at that very time that David said to himself, No, my heart is fixed. Right. Satan, I will not fall into your traps. My heart is fixed. I will not fall into your temptation. My heart is fixed. I will not fall, fall into doing what my flesh wants, doing what I want, trying to get my own revenge and, and taking matters into my own hands. My heart is fixed. That's right. And at that moment, David recognized temptation for what it was because he was established to the truth. It says over in the Psalms, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against God. Right. You see, he knew the truth. He had fastened himself to the truth. He had established himself in the truth. And because of that, he recognized temptation for what it was. You see, when we are not established in the truth and temptation comes knocking on our door, we may not recognize it. We may not realize it. We may think, hey, this is an opportunity. This is a chance for me to get what I want. And not even realize that it's the pit that the devil has dug for us. We, we might not even realize who our enemies really are. We look out and, and we see people around us and think, well, that's my enemy. That's not, that's not your enemy. There's not a soul on this earth who is your enemy. The Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against Satan. That's our enemy. That's the one digging the hole before us. Those people, the, the world that comes against us and tells us that we're wrong, the world that tries to push us to the side, the world that doesn't want to hear about Christianity, those are the people that we want to see saved. Those aren't our enemies. Those are the individuals that we want to see them come to know the truth. We want to see them be saved. We want to see them come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because we don't want to see them spend an eternity in hell. Uh, th those are not our enemies. Satan is our enemy. And when our heart is established, 
We recognize the temptation and the traps that he places before us. We recognize the pits and the holes that he digs before us. We recognize the nets that he lays out before us. And when we are firmly established in the truth of God, when we see those, we're able to go around them and say, my heart is fixed. We're able to avoid them and say, my heart is fixed. I know the truth, and I'm sticking to the truth. You see, when your heart is fixed, you're able to focus in the midst of fear. You're able to have faith that cannot be swayed. And when temptation comes knocking on your door, you're able to maintain that firm stance, even in the face of temptation. And all the while, the world around you is watching. All the while, the world around you is putting the pressure on. And the world around you begins to realize we can't change them. And the world begins to change. You want to see an effect happen as a result of your service to God? You want to see your friends and your family members and your neighbors and your co-workers realize who Jesus Christ is? You want to see uh, them uh, come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? We have to be fixed. We have to be firmly established. We want to see the valley change. We want to see our community change. We want to see our society change. Then this church has to be fixed. We have to be established. We cannot go with the flow. We cannot go with the current. We must stay fixed on the things of God. I wonder this morning, is your heart fixed? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Are we established in the things of God? Are we established in His truth? Are we fixed in His ways? Or when trouble comes, when problems come, when the pressure comes down on us, do we start to sway? Do we start to waver? Does our focus begin to, to drift off the things of God and onto the problems and the storms all around us? When temptation comes knocking on our door, are we able to maintain our firm stance, recognizing temptation for what it is? Or, or do we begin to, to fall into those traps? I wonder this morning, is your heart fixed? If you're here this morning and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know that you're saved. You have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If he should come or you should die right now, you're ready to meet him. Would you raise your hand? I'm saved and I know it. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Wonderful. Almost every hand in the room. So knowing that, knowing you've been saved, are you established? Are you firmly fixed? Won't you raise your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me that I might be firmly fastened in his ways, firmly fastened in his truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you for those hands. Won't you come this morning as the altar is open? Won't you call upon his name to fix you into his truth, to establish you into his truth, to acknowledge that he's the one holding you. You're not keeping yourself under your own strength. The altar is open. Won't you come? Won't you come and call upon his name to firmly establish your ways in his truth, to be able to hold on to his truth no matter what this world brings upon you? Won't we come together as a church and pray that we will be able to stand firmly on his truth no matter what happens around us, so that we might see the change that we want to see. These have come. How about you? The altar is open. Won't you come? You know, maybe you're here this morning, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never fixed yourself into that truth. You've never trusted in Him as your Lord. I want you to know this morning, the Bible tells us that we have no promise of tomorrow. That today is the day of salvation. And if we do not know Him as our Savior, then we have no hope. All we have to look forward to is hell. The Scripture tells us that if we don't know Him, the wages of sin is death. That we will face an eternity dying in hell. But that the gift of God is eternal life. And that free gift is offered to you today. His truth is offered to you today. Maybe you can say, I, I don't know what to ask. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to pray for it. Won't you just come? I'll meet you at the altar. If you've got questions, we can answer them. He is waiting for you. Won't you come?
almost persuaded today. Be fully persuaded in Him. Firmly fastened to His truth. Won't you come? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we've had. God, we thank you for those who have come out today. God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you can hold us fast in the place that we need to be. God, that you establish us in your truth. Lord, I pray that every Christian here would seek to be established in your truth. God, that we would seek to stand firm on your truth. That when the pressure is put on us, God, that we would focus on you. That our faith would not be swayed and that we would continue in your truth. God, I pray as a church that we always fasten ourselves into your truth, that we establish ourselves in your truth so that we might see the change and the impact that we want to see in this community and all around us, God, that we will see souls saved, and we will glorify you for it all. And it's in Jesus' blessed name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Appreciate everyone that's come out this morning. It's been a good place to be. Uh, I, I'm excited about... Uh, uh, the, the season ahead of us and everything that's coming up. We've got uh, the candlelight service coming up this coming weekend, right? Yes, sir. It's this coming weekend. I need to learn my lines. <laughs> but I'm, I'm excited about it. It's a, it's a wonderful time to come together. It's a wonderful time to be in church. It's a wonderful time to focus on Him. Um, as we uh, begin to, to close out here today, uh, if you have any questions, if there's anything you want to talk about, if you want to know more about salvation, you want to know more about baptism, if you're interested in, in knowing more about joining the church and what's, what that's all about, uh, we do have a booklet, and uh, I can share that with you. We've got plenty of copies up here. Also, if you just want to ask me questions, I'll, I'll try my very best to answer them, and if I don't have an answer, I promise you I'll try to find an answer. Um, but uh, we're here for you, and uh, if there's anything that you need, just let us know. Um, uh, we have also, we are going to be taking up a, a special offering here today. Uh, there are uh, several kids in our community that were uh, identified by the local schools as, as being in, in special need, that they, uh, they don't have the, the warm clothes that they need for this time of year, they don't have the right shoes that they need for this time of year. And, and when, those were, were, uh, uh, when we were notified that that was going on, uh, Corey said, well, we want to do something. Uh, we want to try to help them out. We want to try to do whatever we can because nobody, nobody should go to school cold this time of year. And, and not having the right kind of clothes, the right kind of shoes, not having what they need. And so and we want to do everything that we can to help our community. And so uh, we're going to take up a special offering uh, for these individuals that have been identified. And uh, we're going to, uh, the church is going to do a little bit of shopping, find the things that they need, uh, and uh, be able to take care of and help those individuals. So if I could uh, get a, a couple uh, uh, trustees to help me out, what we're going to do is we're going to take up this offering, and then we're going to be dismissed. So, uh, oh, man. They're all coming. <laughs> that's, that's right. Mike says it. You move. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for uh, us to be dismissed and pray over this offering. And then as Tanya plays, they're going to go through. And after the plate's passed, we can uh, go ahead and head on our way. And don't remember church tonight. Um, we're going to have skip practice at 5. So if you're part of that, please be here. And then uh, service at 6 o'clock. And uh, Brother Chris is going to be preaching here tonight. So uh, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for everything. God, we thank you for this, uh, for, for this service that we've had. God, we thank you for being able to come together and worship your holy name. Lord, I pray that you would just bless the rest of our day as we go along. Lord, that you bring us all back safely here together to worship you once again tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would be with this offering. Lord, help us to uh, be able to share your love uh, to this community and be able to, to help those that are in need, to be able to shine a light and a witness to those uh, around about us, God, and to give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.